thanks for this webinar and for the four others to come. It's the same, <laughs> the same etiquette, of course, for all. Um, <clears throat> as we just noted, we are recording. We do that for all sessions in plenary and we'll upload it uh, on the platform website afterwards. Um, please keep your mic muted, but you're invited and encouraged to keep your camera on at all times, depending how it works. Huh? You can also ask questions anytime, um, either by raising your hand um, or by using um, the mic, uh, but also by using the chat. Chat is a good is a is a good way. Then I can follow the chat while um, Georg is um, um, leading through the sessions. So, um, just as is, as it is the first um, webinar of the series, allow me some quick words about the Swiss Angel DRA platform. Um, the platform is a network of today 19 organizations, Swiss-based uh, organizations. Our aim is to foster a common understanding on how to best integrate disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation into programs and projects, and ultimately to increase the resilience of the communities we work for um, with our projects. This learning journey is part of capacity strengthening as one of the three working areas of the platform, providing conceptual support and engaging in advocacy and policy dialogue are our other two working areas. The platform receives financial contribution um, from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and including this learning journey. Um, oops. Yeah. Sorry, I have several screens and I want to put something in the chat as well. OK. Um, the webinar today is the first module of the second part of the learning journey. Um, the second part focuses on risk assessment and has the objective to enhance our capacity as practitioners so that we can ind independently conduct the risk assessment and determine the cost benefit ratio of a DRA measure. And probably not know how to work with GIS, that is probably too ambitious for two times two hours, but get a good glimpse of how to work with GIS. The second part consists of five webinars that take place from March to May. You see it there and you have received the save the dates already. Um, following this introductory webinar today, we will have two webinars on quantitative risk assessment and cost and benefit cost benefit analysis, and two webinars on GIS. Please note, and we already put that in the invitation, that the two webinars on quantitative risk assessment build on the learnings of uh, part one on hazard assessment that was conducted in 2023. To get the best possible learning experience, we recommend participants of the two quantitative risk webinars who have not attended the first part to complete the modules one, introduction to hazard assessment, three, hazard assessment flood, and five, hazard mapping flood in self-study online. I have just put the link of the respective platform website in the chat. You find the recordings and presentations of the webinar modules under documents at the bottom right of the page. And that's um, just all from my side as an introduction. As a year ago, we managed to have the same two great uh, resource persons for this learning journey, Andrea Blindenbacher for GIS and Georg Heim for the risk assessment. They are both experts in their respective topics. Let me now directly hand over to um, Georg. Um, Georg, and, and um, just before you start, you know, I'll have a, just a small introduction. You are a geomorphologist by background with a Master of Science in Geography. 
and you have extensive experience in hazard risk assessments, as well as the planning and implementation of mitigation measures, among other. So please, Georg, now you have the floor. Thank you, Tony, and uh, hi to everybody. Warm welcome uh, from my side as well. Uh, I'll try to share the screen to show you the presentation. Okay, just pleased to have um, uh, an input. If all of you can can see my screen, does that work? Yes. Okay, great. So let's start. As Tony mentioned, uh, this learning journey addresses risk assessment, and for that I have in some case make a step back to repeat some elements uh, from uh, the, the most important basis, which is the hazard assessment of the hazard map. So those who participated uh, in the last learning journey will see some repetitions uh, in this first uh, module, um, but during the um, group works, those people can can help uh, a lot uh, to others. Okay. Yeah, first I would like to start with um, a short video um, from a debris flow in Peru, which occurred uh, nine years ago. Um, in Virgen del Rosario, what you can see is um, a very granular, uh, slowly uh, running debris flow, but uh, it had uh, a huge impact in this village here in, uh, in Via de Rosario. What I would like to ask you is quite an obvious response questions, is there a need for mitigation measures? I think all of us would repeat yes, for sure. Um, including if I tell you that in the last 30 years, more than 100 people died, not just in this small catchment, but in the in the other catchments around this uh, village, uh, very close to this village. Um, so an easy question to answer. Maybe it will be more difficult if I show you this uh, photo where you can see um, a small river um, flowing from left to right, uh, where you can see any debris flows at the moment. The question is, is there a need for mitigation measure as well? So to answer these questions, it will be necessary to do a, a hazard analysis to have the information about future possible future events. By flooding, by debris flow, what what it uh, it's 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 it matters here. But let's go back to um, to the um, picture from from Peru. Uh, the second question will be more difficult. If I ask you, with your limited money you have, um, how much would you invest at most to help those people in this specific uh, village? to prevent from future um, debris flows. That means, for example, for structural mitigation measures could be also other kind of, of, of measurements. But how much money would you invest at most? And how can you justify your investments when a donor is asking you? So here it won't be possible to get rapidly an answer. But that, that's what we will talk about during this module and the next three, two modules as well. How can we measure the, the, the risks? How can we measure how much money I could invest? It's also an ethical question, but we will, have, we will, we will discuss it. What would be interesting for us um, to get your answers about this specific question, which are your criteria to decide for mitigation measures? So if when you have to justify why you spent money in, 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 in this area, 
um, that would be great to have your, your criteria. This QR code that you see on, on the button uh, isn't the, the active one. I will show you the active one we prepared, which is This one here. I can't bring it to the screen. Yes, now it works. OK, now it appears. So I would like to ask you to, to use this QR code and for three minutes just to get your your impressions, your criteria. There could be a few words, for example. It depends on how many people are uh, exposed to those uh, 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 hazards or other criteria. So just put your name and then a uh, few words. What do you think about? I see that uh, probably will appear your responses after the the time that we have left. We have at the moment seven responses. We have a half a minute left. Okay, maybe we have um, similar responses. Let's see, civilization in area affected. Don't know if that means the amount of people affected relevant for the communities. Okay, so uh, the person from who, who wrote that maybe can help me what it means exactly criteria would be to advise the people settled around there to relocate settled around there to relocate yeah maintenance must be community owned oh great very important aspect uh, we have river direction the probability of hazard assessment, that means uh, which is the, the, the frequency of um, the return period of events, the frequency of events. The feasibility of mitigation measures, great. Um, you will decide for mitigation measures if they have an evacuation plan, emergency room, 
It depends on likelihood of risk. Ah, the benefit must be higher than the costs. Okay, that would be the the the, the key the key uh, sentence of this learning journey. Likeliness of disaster. Uh, asking for probabilities. The available money. Degree of financial loss, number of affected people, number of people affected as well, number of impacted people on previous disaster. Yeah, these are, thank you for your responses. These are, many of them we will quantify. We have to quantify to uh, calculate the cost effectiveness of mitigation measures. So um, we will, reuse your answers in um, in the next um, uh, module. We'll use this, this criteria. Thank you. So I will go back to um, the introduction. The aim of these learning journeys, as Tony mentioned, from last year we, we uh, realized the um, hazard assessments for floods and landslides, so we knew the methodology to, to do this analysis. And with Andrea, we handled satellite data and the use of drones in the field as well. So this year we'll, we'll build on these uh, experiences to define uh, the critical sites which are the sites where we have intolerable damages, expected intolerable damages. There's a methodology to define these critical sites. And then to go to quantitative risk assessment where we can justify our investments. And Andrea uh, will in, the, in, in two modules also uh, talk about GIS and OpenStreetMap as Tony mentioned uh, before. Uh, all we will discuss uh, in this learning event, uh, learning journeys, can, will, you, you, you can find that on www.hazardrisk.com. That's the, the website where all the, the, the guidelines and uh, helpful uh, tools uh, are stored. Part of this recapitulation is to, to show you that there are a different level of intensities. If we have to describe a hazard level, we will distinguish between three intensity levels. For floods, that will be a high intensity. Uh, the upper picture here, uh, where uh, houses can be destroyed, people will die if they uh, are as, uh, affected by the flood. Um, in, on the other side, uh, medium intensity uh, is causing damages as well, huge damages, but people could resist the flooding if they are hanging on a on a on a on a on an object. Um, and for low intensity um, it can cause damages as well, but never will nobody will die. Um, you can walk through. Um, but damages can occur as well. So these are the th three intensity levels we use to describe the hazard levels. If someone would like to quantify those uh, intensity levels, it's a multiplication of velocity of the of the the flood, the the stream flow, and the flow height uh, inside of the channel, but also outside of the channel. Um, I don't go to detail for this um, uh, numbers to 0 0.5 to 2. Um, this is part of the of the earlier learning journey. But what I would like to to sensibilize you is the this intensity levels, and I would like to ask you and also Nora to build groups. Um, you will find you in in a in in in, in a specific room. Um, where in group you can order um, these images. There are also two uh, videos on the upper right. Um, this is a video and there's another one with this white car. It's also a video. The other ones are pictures. 
And please order these pictures in this um, table here. So you can just copy or move the, the pictures to the responding intensity class. Um, Nora, could you um, split the participants into groups? We will spend 10 minutes in this group and then you will automatically come back. And then probably we can, we can uh, see um, one or two examples of your results. Works that for you, Nora? Uh, yes, uh, everything is prepared. I uh, just uh, would uh, like to uh, put your attention that I already put the link here to the PowerPoint in the chat. And the best is when you all open this link before I uh, assign you to the groups. So um, there are all groups in this one uh, PowerPoint and uh, the rooms are numbered. So there is a room one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, as well in the PowerPoints, uh, there are slides for group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So uh, you have your own um, place to uh, to do this exercise. Um, but I am ready and I will assign you in the rooms. Just a moment. And we will see you in 10 minutes back. You will automatically be brought back. Okay, everyone is back, Nora. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. So, it looks like yes. Yeah, we decided maybe that you could uh, uh, share your screen so we could maybe see one or uh, two examples. Uh, so I don't know. This is a group group one. Don't know where, if you want to comment on this group or how do you want to proceed? Yeah, maybe on the other slide it would be better because I think there are more photos. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, great. I uh, agree with the most of them. Uh, you see on the on the um, the right side on the on on low intensity. Um, Within the stream, for sure, it's high intensity. But outside the houses, these two of the, um, of the houses are affected, but probably until your knees. So you you could walk through. This is low intensity. As well, the photo made in Santiago de Chile uh, is low intensity as well. Even they had a huge damage in 2016. But it's you, you could pass through with your car. Um, while a medium intensity, uh, when you stay on this road, uh, it seems to have um, a lot of energy, a lot of um, velocity of this of the running water. I would consider it as well as medium intensity. Here, uh, with this car, you can see uh, at least one meter uh, flow height. It seems to be. Um, uh, fast velocity, depending where you stay. It could be as well high intensity. Um, and then high intensity for sure. The first picture on the upper side, on the left, the same for the one in the middle. And for the right, this is a, a, a video uh, taken in, in Haiti. And um, yeah. Medium intensity or high intensity could be though uh, both aspects. Yeah, great. Maybe we could see uh, another group, and uh, one of these group members could explain uh, their decisions. To whom could I give the um, the mic? Uh, I will just look 
This one, maybe? Yeah. Group four. Is there somebody from group four that could help us? If not, I will um, intend to comment. Uh, we have the same decision for uh, on the lower part on the right. On the left side is considered as low intensity. Uh, it depends. It has some velocity. I would consider it as medium intensity. But uh, what for me is sure that on the, for middle intensity, the left picture that should be low intensity because you see the people could walk through without uh, any any problems. That would be low intensity. While the three on the upper side, the three photos high intensity. I I, I agree. Those are, are uh, high intensities. OK, so just to to um, as a warm up regarding um, the classification of hazard uh, classes. I would um, share my screen. OK. So when you are classifying hazard levels, um, we, we used to, to, to use a nine field diagram where we are uh, mixing intensities. These three intensity classes we, we saw, uh, for we, we have done the uh, exercise, but we have also information about frequency. Events that will be very frequent we're talking about uh, that can occur every 10 years or even um, more frequent or um, a frequency of 30 years, a generational event that can occur every more or less 30 years. We are in this column and for extreme events which have a return period of 100 years or even less are considered as one, four or seven um, hazard level. So when we are combining areas where we have, for example, low intensity where you could walk through and we have a, a, a very frequent uh, events in that in that um, manner, you're considering this area as um, hazard level three. When you have a very frequent event with high intensities, you are considering this, this area, this polygon or this area in your map as hazard level nine and so on. So this is the, the recommendation we are giving to mixing these two informations about intensity and frequency. The higher the number, the higher the hazard level. Uh, we will normally uh, coloring uh, those hazard levels. That means um, hazard levels one, two and four are considered as low hazard levels where you don't have any, um, it's not mandatory to take mitigation measures, but it's more a, a, an information recommended for those people living there. It depends if it's um, for very sensible objects like hospitals, like schools, uh, it's recommendable to take mitigation measures, even they are in the yellow uh, hazard class. Um, medium hazard level are those three, five and six. And for independent, uh, independent on the frequency of events, if you have areas with high intensity, they are always considered as high hazard levels. So this nine field diagram um, is used in, in, in different countries, um, in some of the countries with uh, different colors, but that doesn't matter. You have to, to, be, um, to agree with your partners, with your actors, with your stakeholders, which color you would uh, uh, use. But the idea of the nine field diagram is very used. So I would like to give you an, uh, an example of hazard mapping. In this picture here, we have the Valenzuela catchment in Chile. 
It's a um, small catchment, seven kilometers square in, uh, in the Andes. That means between 2,700 meters up to 5,000 meters. It's a torrent that you can see uh, running from right to left, uh, going to the valley. Uh, and what you see in purple is the area where it, we were asked to map the, the hazards. Not in the catchment, there wasn't an interest to map hazards because there's there's nobody living there. But in this area here are the populated area. So in the purple um, polygon, uh, the idea was to realize the hazard map. You see the same torrent running from right to left and you have the, the main stream, the big uh, um, river from up, running up to down. And you can see some buildings here. You can see as a road net, uh, some installations here. So for this area, it was asked to do the hazard mapping. Um, that is the result. Uh, how to do that? I will refer to the, the last learning journey. But just to explain you what that means, you have in the higher area here, uh, EN8, EN stands for inundation or flooding with a, a hazard level 8. That means medium frequency every third year approximately and high intensity. This is debris flow affected this area here. While uh, more down uh, river um, inflow direction downside, you have this red area where you have class 7. Only in extreme events with a return periods of about 100 years, you will have high intensity. So it's considered as red area. Um, and on the um, more remote areas, it's followed by EN4 and EN1. That means low frequency and medium or low intensities. With this map, it's just a, a necessary basis for the definition of critical sites and to answer the questions, is there a need to protect? Is there a need for mitigation measures? And um, to answer that, I colored all the building uh, buildings and the, um, the street net. Um, and to answer the question, is there a need for mitigation measures? In several working groups with um, uh, the concerned actors, we defined the maximum admitted hassle level before to consider a building or an object or a, a, a crop field as um, a, a critical site. So when farmland areas are affected by hazard levels eight or nine, you will have a protection deficit. That means that would be a critical site. In that case, we elaborated that in Honduras up to uh, hazard level seven, it's not considered as a critical site. It's acceptable, this kind of hazard level. While uh, the contrary is a hospital or a school center where only a maximum of, of tolerable hazard level is the one. That means low frequency, low intensity. If the hospital is prone to hazards higher than one, it's not acceptable. But this is not a generation uh, uh, mandatory to use this, um, this uh, table. You should define it together with your actors. Uh, if you can, with with um, with with uh, local governments uh, or all the involved actors. Important is that all of the actors have the same idea of how to to define critical sites. In our example, um, we have different types of of. Uh, buildings and I color it, I classify, uh, I was classifying this um, object types, for example, the 
brown one, 14, 6 and 7, that means are brick houses, while the 3 and the 4 are commercial centers. And you have also a church, the number 17, and several in green, several administration buildings. Considering the table I showed you in the slide before, um, I wrote also the maximum tolerated hazard level for each object type. That means an example. This building number 12 is within red area, inundation 7. But the maximum tolerated hazard level is for brick houses is uh, hazard level 4. So we have a gap between 4 and 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 seven. That means this one here is a critical site. Uh, for example, number eight here, this administration building is within a hazard prone area with class one. The maximum tolerated hazard level is two. So we are we are okay. So there's no uh, critical sites to, to consider in our project planning. So um, I would like to ask you to go back to groups and then just with three, two or three minutes, I say maybe three minutes, please count all the critical buildings that you can see in this in the screen um, and write your answer in in the chat. Uh, maybe just an um, organizational uh, question, Nora, I haven't prepared slides to go in, in groups. Maybe a group work is not possible. What do you think? Uh, if they would need this uh, image yeah, need to do the group work, not unfortunately yeah. yes okay let's make it different each one of you builds his own group and please write count the the critical sites and write it in the chat so you can uh, still see my my screen here and we can use about three minutes from now One person found seven objects as critical sites. I just have to give the the total uh, the total number, not the classified by by object type. Just the the number of of objects uh, which are critical. Tony is counting 16. René. Ah, you wrote the numbers of the objects as well. Just to enter the total sum of, of uh, critical sites. Sergio, as well as Tony, 16, Caroline found two.
Anna 14, Thomas 14 and 2. When both is 4, it is then critical. No, it isn't. Nina 13, Miriam 15. So it looks like we are all around between 12 and 16. Water tank 43, outer water tank 17. Yeah, I think we can. We, we can stop here and to count together. We have number 43, which is a reservoir. Maximum tolerable hazard level is two, but we have we are within seven. It's a critical side one. The 11 as well should be not higher than four, but we are in, in seven. Number two. 12, 3. Uh, I think all of the objects within the red area are critical sites. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Number 17, it's the church, maximum 2. We are within 4. Okay, this also critical site. I think that's it. 45 brick house maximum tolerated is four we are within four we are fine but it's about 15 more or less critical uh, sites objects which represent critical sites so we can mark those critical sites all the one uh, in in purple are defined as critical sites now the question I repeat the question, shall we intervene? Shall we um, um, enter with a project for mitigation measures? There are not a specific number of objects to define if you have, if you could plan and realize mitigation measures. But the, the general rule, if several objects are critical sites, or have a protection deficit, it's recommended to plan mitigation measures. In that case, yes, it's recommended to, to define the mitigation measures. What here we haven't considered is the street net. You, you could consider that as well. Um, with this about... Sorry, sorry, Georg, I didn't understand. Sites, uh, I sorry. didn't understand. What we haven't considered is the sweet what? I didn't understand you there um, exactly. Yeah, you have also the street net here. Ah, the street this, net, the, okay, the sorry. green uh, lines here, okay. yeah. uh, which is also uh, <clears throat> an object that could uh, suffer damages, uh, cutting roads, uh, uh, cutting possibilities to, to go from point one to point B, uh, should be considered as well. In that example, we haven't done it. The same for um, crop fields, uh, you should consider as well, it's an important uh, uh, object type, which can't be found in this example, as we are almost on 3000 meter altitude. With this um, slide, I would like to, to um, give us a, a short break of 10 minutes, and then to go on based on this result here. Is that okay for you, Tony and Nora as well? So please be back, uh, yeah, in 10 minutes. See you then, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ishvara, now I hear you. I heard you, but in the in the working in the group work, I didn't.
Georg, I think I, I, I have the time, the 10 minutes uh, on my watch. Is it OK if we um, restart? Shall I give you the floor? Thank you, Tony. Yes, welcome back. Uh, before break, we saw this uh, image and where you can see the, um, the object with a protection deficit, that means critical sites. Uh, maybe you defined, decided to, to um, plan and realize mitigation measures. Um, we have done that as well in this catchment and um, the actual idea is it's not already built, but the idea is to uh, construct um, an earth dam uh, to protect at, uh, at least the right part, the upper part from this um, the hazard area to protect those uh, buildings. Um, not just the dam, but also to uh, excavate, um, to build a channel to guide the debris flows in this area where almost you can, uh, aren't are any, uh, almost are you just, there are just a few objects within this area here. And also um, a sediment retention in this area here. So we will modify the hazard map because we are guiding future flows in that direction. That means we still have hazards in that area, but we don't see any high hazards, high um, hazard levels. And uh, also we can't see any medium level hazards, just uh, EN inundation one low frequency and low intensity so that can be is acceptable um how much should this mitigation measure cost what's the, the maximum um amount of money we, we we could spend in this area here for that we have to calculate the actual risk the risk without and with mitigation measures to measure benefit and to compare it with the costs. And that's the risk concept I would like to show you with this um, uh, example with the um, five luxury cows. You can see in this table here, in this rectangular table, this cows um, in, have to, to, to go out to, to eat grass. So they have two options to leave the stable or they go with the by the door here or on the lower side they take this door here um, they have to make attention because uh, behind one of the two doors there is a, a very hungry wolf uh, which will eat all of the five cows and this is not what the farmer would like to to see so the probability for the farmer probability that his cows will be eaten um is 50 percent because the two options exist for the cows the wolf is um uh, waiting here so if they flee by this door they are they are lucky and if not they are dead so the probability to be eaten is uh, or the probability of death is 50 percent that means 0 0.5 when we calculate the risk for the actual situation, we have to consider the expected damage, which is five cows multiplied with the value of each cow, a thousand dollars. That's why I mean the luxury cows and multiplied by the probability of death, which is 0 0.5. That means the expected damage for the farmer is two thousand five hundred dollar US. The definition of risk is the expected damage per a certain time period, normally per year. So um, if the wolf is not waiting all the time behind the door, but he will re, uh, come back every 10 years, a return period of 10 years, we can divide this $2,500 by 10. That means 
the actual risk is $250 per year. That's the risk quantified for the actual situation. If the farmer dis is decides to take mitigation measures, he could, for example, shut the, the wolf, but as he is a very peaceful farmer, uh, he decides for another mitigation measure. That means he, he builds two additional doors. So how risk is changing now? We still have the five cows. We still have the same value of the cows. We have the same return period of the wolf, but we have four options to flee. That means the only thing that is changing is the probability of death from 0 0.5, from 50% to 25%. So we can do the same uh, calculation, 5 multiplied by 1000 divided by 10 multiplied by uh, 0 uh, uh, 0.25. So the risk with the mitigation measure have been reduced to $125 per year. So the difference between 250 for the actual risk with the risk with the mitigation is the same value, $125 per year. So this is our benefit from this, or far, the farmer's benefit from these two additional doors. His risk reduction is $125 per year. So how to compare that um, benefit with the costs of the mitigation measures? We have uh, this risk reduction, as we saw before, $125 per year, and we compare it with the cost of the two additional doors. They cost maybe $2,000, the two doors. They have a lifespan of 25 years. So if you would like to know the costs per year, we have to divide $2,000 by 25. That means $80 per year. And now we have standardized these two values, risk reduction and cost, and we can compare. And we see that the benefit is higher than the cost of the measure by $45 per year. So the value, the, the relation benefit cost is higher than one. It's 1 1.6 in this case. So all the mitigation measures with a benefit cost relation higher than one are recommended to realize. For sure, you will probably look for other mitigation measures and you take the best one. But the, uh, all of the pro possible mitigation measures have to be higher than benefit cost relation one. With this uh, concept, uh, you can justify your investment. For example, in, in, in my county, in Switzerland, um, if you work uh, as an as a engineering company and you will present a cost-benefit uh, benefit cost relation higher than one, the Swiss government has to pay the mitigation measures. They have to give us a, a financial... Uh, um subsidiary probably you you can say the, they, they have to to pay the mitigation mission this is a justification of the investment and for donors if you can say well my mitigation measure is 10 times better than the costs you can quantify it and make evidence of that if we apply this risk concept from the wolf to our real situation in terrain. Uh, we saw the probability to suffer damages, to die or to have loss of assets with the example with the wolf and the cows. The probability to die depended on type of hazard, the wolf. It depend, it's depending on the intensity, that means his bite intensity he has, and the number of doors. In a real situation, uh, the mortality probability to die for persons depends also on the type of hazards. Is it flooding? Is it landslide? Is it uh, avalanches? It depends also on the intensity. You remember our intensity classes. And it depends on the resist, uh, of the, um, the physical vulnerability of the buildings, the resist, uh, resistance of the buildings. It depends if it is the adobe house or is it a 
a concrete uh, house. Um, so the physical vulnerability is different. And it depends as well of agility of people to flee. It's different if these persons are uh, in a hospital uh, with uh, broken legs, they can they cannot flee compared with a school where the school children can flee uh, very fast. And it depends of the daily duration of stay in this building. If it is a, a school with eight hours per day, or is it uh, is it a hospital with 24 hours per day where people will stay in? And uh, that all this aspect has an, uh, an importance on the probability to die. For assets, it's a little bit easier than the criteria for the probability to, to, to get damages. It also depends on type of hazard, on intensity uh, that the house is affected, and the construction type of the building. So I will calculate risks for, for buildings or objects, also uh, agricultural areas, and risks for persons, that means mortality. How to do this? We will learn that in the next module. Um, value is always for probabilities between zero and one. And I won't go to detail because we won't have the time at the moment, but just to uh, explain you what will follow in the next module. Uh, you have on several objects, you have to calculate the, the risks for assets and the risk for persons. This willingness to pay will be, just to give you a short information, will be a very ethic point of the risk concept where we'll see in the next module. Um, All the, um, the guidelines, as I mentioned before, you can find it on hazardrisk.com. I would like to show you the, the, the website we have done. Uh, for example, it exists in English and in Spanish. You can go to hazards, for example, and you can see for flooding, for debris flows, for landslide, and for rockfall, instruction guides. For example, um, for flooding, there's a minimal standard, which is needs a, a lower level of, um, of knowledge, and an advanced level, for example, if you have a lot of experience, or if you invite an engineering company to realize a, a, a hazard map and a, risk uh, analysis, you can um, um, ask them for an advanced standard, a standard. If I open, for example, this button here, you will find a, a PDF where you have with on few pages the working steps uh, to, to um, become your, your hazard map. Please have a look on it. Um, you can also find examples from each of the process, clicking on um, the, um, the picture. This is, for example, what do we understand uh, when we consider rock falls? Um, you find some videos. Uh, and for each process type you find here, find here tools that you can that you can use. For example, those who participated last year in the learning journey, they know Augur, for example, to calculate um, discharges, uh, maximum discharges. You have, um, yeah, check it out. Um, and the same thing for risks, you will find um, instructions, guidelines, you will also find um, an installation file from Mi Resiliencia, uh, where you can download this application, and that's I would like to to give you that as a homework to download this file, um, so we can work all together uh, during the next module. Um, 
that's what I would like to present you now, Mi Resiliencia, how it works um, to calculate risks and to measure um, cost benefits. Um, Mi Resiliencia, when you download it, instead of calculate by your uh, on your computer for each object uh, the risks, it takes you a lot of time. So that was the idea to create uh, this tool. Um, it was um, first, it was de developed for the Bolivian government uh, and applied also for, um, for Honduras, um, Bolivia, Chile. So it, it works in, in, in different countries uh, and you can use it in, in every country. So, um, for everybody, it's, it's, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. You can use it as an offline version or as an online version. You just need uh, internet to have the, the, the satellite image. Afterwards, you, you won't need any, any uh, internet access. Uh, it consists on several working steps to define the risks and cost benefit of mitigation measures. Just to explain you, you can um, look for your area by clicking uh, your point of interest, burn, for example, and it will switch the, the auto photo, the satellite photo to burn. Uh, we will stay here in our uh, area that we have learned before. You can also uh, search by coordinates to go to your specific place. The uh, satellite images are available for the whole world. In some area, it's a little bit more precise than in others. You could also enter your own drone photo, your own uh, auto photo if you want. Um, <clears throat> and on the upper side of the tool, there are some menu, very common menu like pan function to move your your area to zoom in, uh, to zoom out, um, however you, you need to do that. So it's working very slowly on while the presentation. I'm sorry for that, but it works. Yeah. So the working steps I would like to show you is I already prepared an example. In the field, you are doing your hazard mapping. So this tool doesn't provide you the hazard map. You have to do, to do it outside of the tool. And then you have to enter your results, what you see here and with the colors, the hazard map in the tool. You can upload it from GIS. You can also download it from here. If, when you digitalize here in the tool, you can download it to your GIS. So it's it's uh, it's open for other applications. Uh, you have first to define your mapping area. I made um, a, rec um, a rectangular here because mi, resili mi resiliencia just will calculate within the working area. You can modify it if you want. You can fully digitalization possibilities, end of editing, and you're, you're back. As a second step, ah, and each working step is shown on the, um, on the right side in this, in this layer view here. For example, um, the perimeter is, um, I can activate and disactivate it. If I go to the next working step, as you see, this symbol here represents the hazard. You have to uh, enter the hazard map for the actual situation. You can distinguish between debris flows, flooding, landslide and rockfall. Uh, we are now on debris flow and um, I prepared this example here, but you can also um, digitalize a new polygon. Uh, For example, this one here, you can switch from hazard level one to hazard level nine. Just to show you an 
how that works. Um, and then as a next, and it appears, it appears um, the hazard map here in the layer viewer. As a next step, once you have entered your hazard map, you have to localize and digitalize your objects that we we checked before if it is a, a, a critical site or not. The digitalization of these points, you can also upload uh, it from GIS. Uh, it's easy. You have different object classes. You have buildings, you have infrastructure, you have agriculture areas, special objects. Um, on, from each class, there are several sub object types. For special objects, you have health posts, you have hospital, you have a main school. Um, for buildings, you have um, brick houses, water tank, yeah, whatever. So if I see uh, on my satellite photo that I have different objects, I can digitalize them. Here, 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 and so on. Um, and editing, and then it will store your digitalization. You can select each of these objects and define the calculation factors for uh, the risk calculation. Uh, in, it, it gives you a, um, a recommendation for the value of, of this object I, I, I highlighted here. That means 300,000 is a very expensive uh, brick house. Maybe there are price levels in, in, in almost in Switzerland, but you can change it. If you say, no, this house doesn't cost 3,000, uh, $300,000, it costs just uh, 500. So you just enter it here and you, you, you store your, your modification. You can also define uh, how many floors does this building has, for example, two floors, how many persons per floor are living here? I go to nine. And how many hours per day are you staying in this house? Probably 12. I will save these changes and it will appear uh, instead of a blue point. So, just a second. Damage potential. Instead of a blue. So. Instead of a blue point, it appears a red point. That means you, you modified the predefined values of each object. It doesn't matter, but just to have the control where the person uh, who entered the data made some modi modifications on the standard values. You can apply these modifications on the, each one of the objects um, to get your reality in your area of project. The next step is um, the definition of um, uh, capacities on this area. We, we don't have just vulnerabilities, we also have capacities. And for every object where um, where um, where money will be will uh, where money is built, um, you can consider um, capacities. That means also for agricultural area because there are income areas. Um, uh, a factory is also a point where you can uh, build income, so it's also considered as area or object with um, where you can enter um, capacities. If I select, for example, one of these objects as this one here, I have to define level of different criteria. Maybe it's a little bit small, but I cannot increase the, the screen. Sorry for that. But you have criteria like, do you have a functional emergency committee? You can define the development level of the functional emergency committee. If you go to zero, there's no emergency committee. If you go to one, that means perfect functional emergency committee. 
on the right side, on the relevance factor, you can define if it is an important aspect or not. In that case, yes, it is very important. So I switch that to one. The second point is if you, the question, if you have a functional early warning system, uh, if you have uh, institutions providing emergency care, electricity supply in emergencies, availability of alternative agricultural areas, if your agricultural area is damaged, labor flexibility, income insurance coverage, which will be quite different in many cases, and if you have contingency plan. So you have this two, four, six, eight criteria to define your capacity level. This is made just for this um, object here, but you can copy if you say, well, the capacity is for the whole area is the same. You can just transfer the capacity to all damage potential by applying this bottom here. And you have defined for all of them the same uh, capacity level. This is the, the, the fourth working step um, in Mi Resiliencia. And then we go to the next one, which is the definition and um, the digitalization of the mitigation measure. As I show you, showed you before, we have the flow direction that side. We would like to, to protect this area here. So we build a, a, a protection dam on that, on that side, you have to digitalize it, as we have seen for the other uh, working steps as well. I have already done it. You have to enter here, value the cost of this um, earth dam, protection dam. Chile is an expensive country, so protection measure is as well very expensive, $2, uh, two million uh, dollars with a lifespan of in that case, 40 years, but I can go to 30 years, for example, um, or if better, maybe 50 years. And it has also a maintenance cost. Each year we have to invest to, to, to maintain the, the, the earth dam. You have to consider that as well. You go to save your inputs and we are almost done. The next working step is to map the, to to make the hazard map for the situation, considering our mit, uh, mitigation measure. As I showed you before, the debris flow will flow along the, the the dam and to affect this area here, but it will almost protect this area where most of the buildings are. We have still a hazard level one on that area here. We optimized the situation for sure, but is it cost effective? That we have to to calculate first. Maybe you uh, you you your project considered all as well um, the um, uh, improvement of capacities. You choose the next bottom, and you can modify the capacity you entered before. In the best case you have, you are all in all criteria, you're on the best level. Um, you put save as well, and then it will be applied uh, for, for all the objects. OK, now we are done. That's all you have to do in Mi Resiliencia. We can see our results uh, to look if it is cost effective uh, or not. So we have to push the analysis button. It um, takes a while. Okay. Now. It is working very slow on the screen, but it works. OK, you have your project summary or your summary of your planned mitigation measure. 
the name of the project, Valenzuela, dam as mitigation measure, time and uh, date of elaboration of Resiliencia um, document. And here you have the most important uh, result. You have this column here, the monetized risks for the actual situation without mitigation measures. That means almost $450,000 per year, um, the whole amount, amount of, of, of the risk in total. The risk considering the mitigation measure is almost zero. But you still have a, a remaining uh, uh, risk, but it's much lower. The difference between the actual risk and the risk with the mitigation measure is the third column. So this is your benefit that you compare with the costs of the mitigation measure. And the relation between the green and the gray column gives you the relation uh, cost benefit or benefit cost. In that case, it is higher than than one. It's four point five. Uh, it's it's okay. You 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 are uh, it's recommended to realize mitigation measures. Uh, in Miresiencia, we applied also um, between one and five um, the rating that realization has to be discussed. Uh, normally, in in um, our project countries, um, it's easier to get a, a very well uh, cost benefit ratio. So maybe you are um, you just consider uh, cost benefit relations higher than five, but it's up to you. It it has to be higher than one. Okay, and on the lower part, I. Don't go to detail now that we will see in, uh, in the next module uh, what more uh, other informations do we get. This you can take a print screen for that and to make evidence that your planned mitigation measure is cost effective. And you have the, um, the methodology described by the, um, by the, the website um, how it works, this, this, um, this risk concept. If you want, you can also find uh, an instruction video from Mi Resiliencia that we have done in Honduras. Uh, the English one is still not um, available. We have to do that in the next few days. Um, and those who doesn't like to use um, a web-based GIS tool can also work with an Excel to calculate risks, but in that case, it's difficult to make the evidence because you don't have a geo localization of your object. So we recommend to use the Mi Resiliencia, um, but it's up to you what works for your project. Okay, it was all these points are went very fast, but we will have the time in the next modules to go in detail and also to to activate you that you can uh, uh, work by yourself for this cost benefit analysis and risk analysis. That's from my side. Um, Tony, yep, you, can I handle to you? You could explain where to apply this yep. risk concept within the project. First, I, I've seen in the chat that we have uh, two questions. One is uh, okay. from Rene. Um, can we use aerial image from drone? Yes. In the Mi Resiliencia tool? Yes. Okay. Will you explain that in, in the next two webinar modules? Yeah, I can do that. Um, for sure, it has to be geo-referenced, your, your aerial image. You have to take several images. You have to create um, a specific tool, your auto photo, and once you is, it is geolocalized, you can enter it. If not, it's not possible. But if it is georeferenced, yes, you can. And then uh, uh, a remark from Thomas um, Kalita: I cannot install my resilience due to limited user rights. I mean that's the same problem I have. I have to because I, I have a company um, notebook, 
I have to go to to our IT people who have administrative rights. Otherwise, I cannot I cannot put it down. If it's something else, please tell me, Thomas. I see you that I see you on the camera. But if it's this, then I would say that would be the explanation. You have if, if you're on a on a on a company notebook, you might not have the administration rights and so you need somebody who has that and convinced that, you know, according to your internal rules, how this works. I have to do the same thing. Um, Tony, mm -hmm. Andrea, Andrea here. Maybe what could be also tried is a right click on the installation file and say install as administrator. Yeah, but I cannot do that on, on, on this. Uh, no, on yours book. probably not, but maybe it's possible for Rene. Yeah, for Thomas, but if a Thomas has Thomas. also one that is provided by World Vision, probably might have the same problem. Okay. But it's good. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks a lot um, to uh, for your hint. Um, if anyone has problems, um, who, who will join, you know, in webinars and modules two and three with downloading, please um, let me know and let Georg know, probably. Georg would be better placed to, to help on that, but um, I would be placed to help like uh, like uh, an applier, like we all are there. And Andrea, can you show your, um, can you show your, can you put on your camera, please? Yeah. If this is possible. <laughs> A bit okay, a, a bit dark, <laughs> a bit dark, but uh, I didn't, I, I've only seen an Andrea, but I didn't know that is the Andrea <laughs> who will then facilitate uh, webinar, uh, webinars five, four and five on GIS. So great, great to have you here also on the introduction. Maybe Andrea, you could at the end take a few minutes to describe your um, modules that you will give. So everybody has an uh, um an information from this part of the the learning journey i can try they're Tony... only in may though <laughs> yeah huh? they're still far away <laughs> okay tony can i handle to you yes um are there any other questions um with regard to the introduction done by um georg would be the time now because we go to a different element now Three, two, one. No, I take it that um, it was a bit. Um, we need to digest what um, what Georg has provided us. You know, a bit of a a lighter a lighter start at the beginning with a more conceptual uh, introduction, and then when it comes to quantified risk assessment, it's just. You need to do that. And you need you need to calculate, do the math, etc. It's just not another way. Even though me resiliencia, um, and and this I noted um, with with um, compared to to other tools, it really helps. It really facilitates um, this part. But you still have to do that yourselves. And we will see in the next in the next uh, webinar um, how a bit much more clearer how how this works. I have to share my screen now. And just give me a second to readdress my laptop. Okay, good. So thanks a lot, Georg, huh, for this um, illustrate, illustrative, recapula illustrate, illustrative recapitulation of what we have done last year and this introduction into the calculation of a risk assessment, including cost benefit analysis. Um, the last part of this um, intro introductory module is about embedding hazard and risk assessment <clears throat> in the project cycle. And let me share our approach and experience. Um, in the Swiss Red Cross, we structure our project cycle in identification, planning, implementation, and closing probably similar type to many of us uh, might be very that might sound very familiar um, <clears throat> in the um, identification phase we use secondary data for the context ana analysis which includes climate and natural hazard risks among many other aspects 
And secondary data can be derived from many, many resources, uh, many sources, global and national, more and more. So it's becoming difficult to, to keep the overview. But I'm not going to go into detail on that. And the results of this screening process uh, flow into the concept note, which is the product of this phase. Um, in the planning phase, um, we support our sister Red Cross and Recrescent Societies in conducting and facilitating hazard vulnerability and capacity assessments. The assessments are mostly done according to a standard approach that we call EVCA, Enhanced Vulnerability and Capacity Assessment. And this approach provides uh, a step-by-step -step process, not only for the assessment itself, but also for the planning of risk reduction and climate adaptation measures. And it also includes a toolbox with a variety of tools, <clears throat> such as focus group discussions, historical profile, seasonal calendar, transect walks, mapping, et cetera, et cetera. Most of them are standard participatory appraisal tools, as we all know and use as um, NGOs. In some cases, we support a more robust hazard and risk analysis based on our respective guidelines. They are the same that we are using in this learning journey and um, where we are also linked um, the, the, the website. And when do we use these guidelines? Um, it's not it's not, not in the majority of cases. There must be two conditions that must be met. Firstly, the intervention area needs to have a certain level of complexity, be it in terms of land use or geography or geology. And if you are in an environment that has a clear hazard risk and a clear exposure of assets, we are fine with the basic uh, EVCA. We don't need more. And secondly, the project teams and or the communities must be aware of the complexity and have the capacity to conduct this more robust hazard and risk analysis. We can support um, the capacity building to do that. Um, but this robust analysis is applied in about 10% of the projects that have DRR and climate change adaptation elements that we are supporting. So it's the majority is, is less a less advanced level. Um, <clears throat> the results of the assessments and the plant measures are taken up in the project document, which is the product of this phase. Also nothing new, but <laughs> many will now say, well, you know, is he cheating a bit, uh, Tony? Because what I just explained is, a, is, is an ideal scenario, a scenario where we have the required resources in terms of time and finances to do the planning in an inception phase. And that is usually only the case in larger mandate-based um, projects. <clears throat> in the common scenario, only a summary hazard and risk analysis is done. Maybe <clears throat> um, focus group discussions in two typical communities with different contexts, and then <clears throat> the project document contains a less detailed action plan. And the real hazard and risk analysis is then done during the first year of the project and the log frame adjusted if needed. I think for many of you, this sounds familiar. And um, yeah, here we go. We encourage our um, sister national societies to use our standard indicators, and we have one that addresses preparedness and one that addresses mitigation. That's the one marked in red. And if we are supporting the robust, has the robust hazard and risk analysis as per our guidelines, we um, very strongly suggest to use the standard indicator. And the, the indicator that comes with a comprehensive guideline, including questionnaire and data analysis. Um, that's how we embed hazard and risk assessments in projects that are community-based disaster risk management or resilience strengthening project. 
um, and which where the risk assessment is done in a more comprehensive way than when we mainstream in mainstream it in, into a health project or or in another sector. That's what I wanted to share and see if there are any questions with regard to that. Does this sound familiar to you or do you have a completely different approach? Or was it too quickly? I thought, you know, it's not math, so it's not so complicated. <laughs> I just give three more seconds for reaction. Don't have any. So not to know, not really sure what, how I can take it. Um, I hope it was clear and it's similar to what you guys are doing as well. Um, <clears throat> Georg, I think you've done the outlook for the next module and the homework. We will also, um, with um, with the link for the next module, we'll also write that down and provide the links to the different um, to the to the website and the tool, etc. Is that okay, Georg? Yeah, sure, that's okay. okay. Yeah, Good. just to repeat, it would be important that you install your um mi resiliencia not not during the the next module but before it and if you have find the time to to uh, check uh, the videos you have done in the last learning journey and maybe to give andrea um uh, that you could spend some words about the the other modules that would be that would be great as well yeah, we have the time, please, Andrea. You're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm Andrea, and I'll be running the two modules on uh, GIS tools where we'll try to bring some data into GIS software, like a satellite image, potentially edit uh, features export them and hopefully even link them with Mi Resiliencia where you can import um, features from other GIS tools. So we'll look into data formats or whatever is needed in order to make that a smooth transition. I'll be sharing folders with um, documentation and uh, if we need data as well as um, software to download or links to online tools. Um, if by next time it turns out that we need more help with uh, drone image processing, I can also share some material on that. Yeah. That's it. OK, good. I think so. Thanks yeah. a lot. Um, Slowly coming to end, I see. Um, any questions left, dear participants? Last chance for today. No? Three, two, one. I don't see anything. No hand, nothing. Okay, good. So um, I hope that. Ah, yeah, who? Hello. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, okay. Um, so I hope that you found this introductory webinar um, as appetizing as I did, and that I hope that um, look and look look forward to seeing you in in two weeks. It's the same time, same day, for the next webinar module. So bye for now, and um, have a nice day and evening and night. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good evening.